first thing class. ever, I have to apologize. My English, my English, um, as you can see, my English skills is very poor. I started my English at the age of 29, so I apologize before. And if ever, if uh, anyone wants to help me out with an idiom, with a word, with a phrase, with a sentence, no problem. You are you are very welcome. So, you use the word idiom, you're doing pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty good. Okay. I'm just, Thank you. I'm just surprised you, you well. learned so much English in six months. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, there's a Hasidic story about Mendelssohn and the Baal Shem Tov. And it goes like Moses Mendelssohn and the Baal Shem Tov. I believe. You, you all heard these names before, maybe? So the story goes like this. In uh, the year 1743, uh, in the year 1743, the Baal Shem Tov was sitting with his disciples and, and telling them a story, a contemporary story that is happening real time. Uh, so he told them, far away in Germany, there is a person, a Malama, the Torah teacher, and his name is Menachem. And uh, he is a pious Jew, but he, he loves also worldly knowledge. He has a son, a very brilliant son, and um, his son is 14 years old now. And, um, and this son is, tra is walking now from Dessau to Berlin. He walked by Moses Mendelssohn when he was a 14 year old. He walked by, by foot from Dessau to Berlin to be together with his former teacher the rabbi of Dessau, who was now the rabbi of Berlin. So Hashem Tov tell, tells his disciples that he, that this, this uh, Malamed has a son that goes to Berlin, and he is the Shliach HaSatan. This boy is chosen by Satan to corrupt the Jewish people in the future. And, uh, and um, he is going to make the Jewish people should become like Goyim. And, uh, but whoever goes in my path, whoever goes in the, follows the Hasidic path, he will be saved from that evil thing. And no worries for that. Now, this is a Hasidic story written in the 20th century about the Baal Shem Tov and Mendelssohn who lived in the 18th century. Question is, is there any truth to that story? So, we'll, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see, in the, we'll see during the lecture, we'll see about that. There's another story. Moses Manson had a colleague. You also have pictures here from both Manson and his colleague, Naftali Herzweisel, uh, who lived also in Berlin. Um, so there's a story, not with the Baal Shem Tov, uh, but with the Baal Shem Tov's great grandson, who everyone heard of, heard of Rabbi Nachman of Bratzlau. There's a story of Rabbi Nachman of Braslev, uh, uh, the Hasidic story, uh, also written in the 20th century by a famous uh, Braslev leader with the name Rabbi Shik. He has, he has a town in Israel of his followers, Yavneel. And um, so he wrote a story about concerning 
Vaisu, Maktoli Ertz Vaisu and Rav Nachman Brasel. The story goes like this. Rav Nachman Brasler lived in a town called Zlatipoli in the Ukraine. And he lived there for two years, but for him it was hell because Zlatipoli is near a town called Spole. In Spole, there was a famous old Hasidic rabbi. We call him the Spole Zeder, the, gra the grandfather of Spole. And he hated Rav Nachman Brasler. He persecuted him the whole two years that Rav Nachman lived in Zlatipoli. Till Rav Nachman saw Zlatipoli is not for him a place anymore. And he had, Rav Nachman had an uncle, a Hasidic tzaddik with the name of Baruch of Mezhebish, who was, who, who was an inheritant of the Baal Tov. He was a grandson of the Baal Shem Tov and he lived in the Baal Shem Tov's town Mezhebish. And he had the control not only of Me on Mezhebish, but on certain towns around Mezhebish, he had the power of. One of the towns was Bratzlev town with the name Bratzlev. So Rebaruch of, the, the Rebaruch of Mezhebish Rebbe, he's told his nephew, Reb Nachman, I give you the town of Bratzlev. You can go there. So Reb Nachman moved from Zlatipoli to Bratzlev, and he lived there for the last eight years of his lifetime until he died from tuberculosis at the age of 38. So, when Rav Nachman moved from Zlatipoli to Bratzlev, he passed by a, a, a town called Uman. Did anybody heard of the town? Yes. Mm -hmm. He passed by the town of Uman, and Uman at that time lived famous maskilim. Nachmanus Rappaport, Heikel Horvitz, Ishber Horvitz, Moshe Landau, and others lived at that time. So Reb Nachman was on Shabbos to Uman. And there is a there is a Breslev Hasidic story written also in the 20th century um, that says the follower the, the following. These maskilim, every rabbi that used every Hasidic rabbi that used to come to the town of Uman and uh, leading a Shabbos there, a Shabbos tish. These maskilim used to go to the Shabbos tush of the Hasidic Rebbe and make fun of him and mock him. And there were some Hasidic Rebbes like the Tzaddik of Bardichev and the Tzaddik of Rublevi Yitzchak of Bardichev and the Tzaddik of Spitivke that wanted to live, they wanted to move to Uman. And these maskilim made sure that they shouldn't be able to make their, uh, to make their, to, to live in Uman. So the same thing, the story goes, happened where Rav Nachman Bratzava came, passed by Uman, and he was there on the Shabbos. These few maskilim went to, after they finished the Shabbos table, they went, they said, let's go to the Hasidic Rebbe's table and let's see what's going on. But when they went there, they got respect to Rav Nachman. And they said, they said within themselves, he is different. He is different than the other Hasidic rabbis. And the story goes that they, they became admirers of Rav Nachman Bratzavir so much that these maskilim asked Rav Nachman, please live here, stay here. And Reb Nachman told them, the story goes, Reb Nachman told them, you know when I will come to you? When you will send me the book, Yein Levanon. Yein Levanon, who wrote the book Yein Levanon? Naftali Herzweisel, the colleague of Mendelssohn, wrote a book, a commentary on Pirkei Avot. At the time, it was the biggest the biggest, largest commentary on Pirkei Avot, called Yein Levanon. 
So Reb Nachman said, when you will send me, Reb Nachman, it seemed that Reb Nachman loved this book. He wanted to read this book. So he told them, when you will send me the book in the Banan. Now, the book that he wanted was a manuscript or a printed book? So, huh? Okay. So first, I will tell. First, I will tell the version of Rabbi Shik. There is a became a popular story, especially in Breslev. And I will tell first his version of the story, and then. And then we'll, we'll see if the story is true and what the original version of the story is. So the popular story of Rabbi Sheik is the following. The Yei Levanon was printed in 1875. Uh, sorry, in 1775. Now, Reb Nachman, when Reb Nachman passed by Uman, was 1802. Okay, so the book was printed for a long time. But Rabbi, Sh the, the story goes that that person, uh, Naftali Herzweisel, the colleague of Mendelssohn, he was a horrible masculine. And he was an evil person who wanted to corrupt it, to corrupt the world with his heresy. The, bi the, the biggest heresy possible heresy in everything, in God himself, everything. And he wrote a very large book called Yen Levanon, and there he wrote down all his heretical thoughts and all his evil influence he put in that big book, Yen Levanon, but he didn't print it. He didn't print it because if he will go and print a radical book, who will listen to him? Jewish people are afraid of heresy. The rabbis will come against, will come, will come out against him. He wouldn't have much of influence. But Naftali Herzweisel was, he was smart guy. He was a trickster. So he, he what he did, he did like this. He, he. He took, he took some good pieces, some neutral and positive religious stuff that, he, that was also included in, in his book. He, he censored them, he, he collected, he made an eclectic, eclectic um, huh? excerpts. Yeah, excerpts, only the good part, and he printed only the good part, and he took he took, he took recommendations uh, for, the, for his book from very famous, from the greatest rabbis of the generation, including the rabbi of Prague, Ezekiel Landa, that you have in the pictures, and, and others. And he thought, like this, you can, you can sit here. So he, uh, he, uh, he, he took some recommendations from famous rabbis on his book. So in that way, he can uh, promote, himself. Huh? promote himself. He can promote himself. He can make himself known in the Jewish community as a very highly author. And then, and then after that, years later, his plan was, his evil plan, was that years later he would pub he will publish his entire manuscript, his entire book, The Yen of Anon, and then he would he would be successful to corrupt the whole world with his heresy. The whole world will be schmadzer. Was a schmad. Even the Goya maybe, but definitely the Jews. <laughs> and so 
What happened? She said she doesn't know what shmad means. Huh? Shmad means means convert. Shmad to convert to Christianity usually. Um. What's that word again? Shmad. Shmad. I thought you said shmad. <laughs> so, so what happened? So what happened? The tzaddik Rav Nachman of Bratzlov, he had eyes that can see far, far away. And in his shtetl in the Ukraine, he saw what's going on in Berlin, in Germany, and he understood what the plan of Naftali Gadzweizel is, what his real plan is, his tricky plan. So his goal, Rabbi Nachman goal, was to find this manuscript and burn it once forever and rescue the whole world from the heresy. So that's why when Abraham Breslover in 1802, it seems strange that from 1775 until 1802, 20, uh, 27. 27? Yeah. 27 years, Weisel didn't manage to publish his book. That's strange. But so the story goes. And so that's why Abraham Nachman Breslover. Uh, he, he told the Maskilim in Uman, you want me to move here with one condition, I will do it. Send me the Yain Lebanon, send me the big manuscript. Because I want to say, because his, his thought was he wants to, to save the world from heresy. Another strange thing is, Weisel, Naftali Weisel in 1802, was still alive and well in Berlin or in Hamburg. How come his masculine in Uman, how should they go, have the manuscript, his manuscript? He's still alive in Berlin. But another, in Yiddish they say, a kasha for mice, a question on a story. That's how the story goes. So, and the story goes further, the, the following of the story is, that, that Rav Nachman left after Shabbos. Rav Nachman left, uh, Rav Nachman left Uman. He moved to Bratzlev. He lived there for eight years, or seven years, until there was a big fire in Bratzlev and half the town was burned down. And Rav Nachman was sick at that time, very sick. <coughs> And he didn't like to live in Bratzlav anymore. So he was thinking about maybe moving to a different city, to a bigger city. And just at that time, at that point, there was, there was a messenger coming from Uman to Bratzlav. A messenger from who? From this masculine. A messenger came with a baggage in, the, in, in his hand. What did it have in his hand? It had a big baggage, the, the manuscript. whole manuscript of the Yen Lebanon of Weisel. And so, this was eight years after Abnachman asked it from, from them. And so, the, so he, he, he came and he asked, in the name of the Maskilim, he invited Abnachman to come live with us in Uman. And Rav Nachman did so. He moved to Uman. This was a half a year before he died. And he is buried in Uman. And thousands of people uh, are traveling every year to his grave in Uman, for Russia, especially for Rosh Hashanah. Um, so now. It, it raises a question. Yeah. Why didn't Hashem deliver the manuscript before the fire? So it was burnt up in, in the fire. Oh, I forgot I forgot the, the main part. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I forgot the main part. Reb Nachman, Reb Nachman, because I'm so used to the to the original version of the story, 
that I forgot Rabbi Sheik's version of the story. Mm -hmm. So the story goes, so the story goes, that Rabbi Nachman took this manuscript of King of Anon. Did I tell it? Did I say it or not? not no. Yet. no. Not yet. He burned it and he saved the whole world from heresy forever and ever. That's how big Rabbi Nachman Brasov is. So, <laughs> well, uh, what can you is, qualify what the are and a muscle, a muscle is an enlightened Jew, a modern Jew, a Jew that likes worldly knowledge. That's in in one hand. There's many many books and articles, hundreds of books about the masculine and what Haskala was and yeah. so on. The age of enlightenment. The age of enlightenment. Yeah. So, now, the question is, if the Baal Shem Tov said that all who goes in the Hasidic path, they will never be corrupted by the Haskalah, I have a question. How come there are so many Hasidim and children and disciples of Hasidic Rebbes that became converts to Christianity, became heretics, became masculine. Many, many of the masculine who devoted their lives to fight Hasidism grew up in Hasidic circles and they themselves were disciples of Hasidic rabbis and some of them were Hasidic rabbis themselves before they became masculine. Including, you wouldn't believe, the, the, the son of the Balatanya, for example, who converted to Christianity after he was a rabbi of a town and a rabbi. So, how come the Baal Shem Tov said that whoever goes on the Hasidic path will never be corrupted by this Haskalah of Moses Mendelssohn? They wouldn't, nothing bad will happen to him. That's one question. Second question is, if, if that story, which Rabbi Nachman is true, how come we find today in Rabbi Nachman's books ideas that come from whom? Ideas that came from the books of Naftali Herzweig. And we find it in Rav Nachman's books, how come? If Rav Nachman only used his book to burn it and not to read it. Now, another question. Say the name of the author that also did Naftali. Naftali advisor, you have him in the pictures. Lower, lower right. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. He's the one with the German wig. <laughs> to I have to to ask to show that where's the wig? Separate. Yeah, he, he and Mendelssohn both wear a wig, and uh, some others in the picture. And this was the style of the time, by the way. This was the the fashion of the time. So everybody Not everybody, but it was a fashion of the time. Among the goyim also. Yeah. Among the goyim and among the Jews, to wear to wear a wig. There's even some rabbis in Italy and in Amsterdam that uh, where are we? Should be there more than one copy of that uh, book? The manuscript? The manuscript? Yeah. The manuscript was burned by everyone. There was only one mask. There was only one mask, according to the story. And I will see, we'll see later if there was, if there was ever a manuscript. We'll see. I have another question on the story with the Baal Shem Tov. <coughs> Okay. When did, what year did Mendelssohn became a mythological devil in, the, in rabbinic history or in Hasidic history? When did it happen? Was it always like that? No. Did it started, in the rabbinic world, it started mainly, started slowly, slowly in 1864, 1864, through a book called Leva Ivri. 
and and by the the tzava, the will. Yeah. the will, the will of Rabbi Moses Sofer, Rabbi Moshe Sofer, the Chatam Sofer, who you have in the pictures, I think, that was published in 1862 for the first time. Then. It happened slowly, slowly in the rabbinic world that Mendelssohn, Moses Mendelssohn, should become uh, a negative, a very <coughs> negative character. But, and by the Hasidim, it started even earlier, okay? But it also, but even by the Hasidim, it took many years. Mendelssohn <coughs> died in Mendelssohn died in 1786. Okay? Now, we have Hasidic books that mention the name of Mendelssohn with respect so late, at least so late as 1814. That's many years, that's uh, about 30 years after the death of Mendelssohn. So if, if the Hasidic rabbis had a tradition that goes back till the times of the Baal Shem Tov, from 1743, when Moses Mendelssohn was only a, a boy of 14 years old, if there was a tradition from then that stay, stay away from this devil, from this uh, uh, messenger of Satan, and, ev and that's why all the Hasidim were saved forever from Mendelssohn's corruption. If there was a tradition like that, how come we find in so many rabbinic books and even in Hasidic books until till the time of 1814 mentioning Mendelssohn with, with respect? That's another question. Now, if you're curious, if you're curious to know what is the real story which Rav Nachman Bresov and Naftali has written, I will give it to you because how do I know the real story? Because the real story was printed long, long before Rabbi Sheik's version. It's printed in, Bres in a Bratzlev book in the year 1931. What year? 1931. Rabbi Sheik's version was published for the first time in the 1970s or the 1980s. But the, re the, the original version was printed in 1931, and so it goes. It's very, very different than Rabbi Sheik's version. And it goes like this. Rav Nachman passed by Uman in 1802, and the Maskilim asked him, please, stay here to live in Uman. And Rav Nachman told them, when you will send me the book Yein Lebanon. Now, Rav Nachman Breslov's own disciple, Rav Nosson Breslov, his, his most, most uh, famous disciple, who actually invented the whole Hasidism of Breslov, and the whole movement of going to Uman of Rosh Hashanah was invented not by Rav Nachman, but by his disciple Rav Nosson Bratzel. So Rav Nosson himself, in his, in his autobiography, in his memoir, he writes the story with the Yen Lebanon, but he doesn't mention the name Yen Lebanon. He gives only a hint. But later, in later Bratzel generation, in 1931, it was published with explicit explicit with the explicit name of the book. So Rav Nachman asked them for for the Yenu Banon. And eight years later, like the, the story was with the fire, and there was a messenger coming from Uman to, to Bratzlev and brought brought the Yen Lebanon for the Rebbe. There is no manuscript, there was never a manuscript. He brought them the printed version of the Yen Lebanon that Rav Nachman didn't have and Rav Nachman wanted to have because Weiss wrote many books, and, and, and Rav Nachman already read his other books, like we see that in his, in his book, in, in his Rav Nachman's books, there is, there is ideas of Weiss from his other books. 
but he didn't have the, the big book Yen de Banan, the commentary of Pirkei Avot. And it was, it was, um, it was a, a, a seldom book in the, in, the, in the Ukraine. And maybe one of the reasons why it was uh, an expensive uh, book and not very uh, uh, distributed is first of all because Weisel is a Moscow in Berlin. Second of all, in 1782, there was a big, when Rav Nachman was only a boy of 10 years old, there was a big rabbinical struggle against Weisel and Mendelssohn that continued only for a few years, and then they were rehabilitated. But at that time, in 1782, when some great rabbis came out with a ban on Weisel and Mendelssohn, they said, everybody that has Weisel's books at home shall bring it to the rabbi in shul, and we'll put it in a place in Geniza, we'll, we'll put it away. Nobody should, any, should, 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 should use his books anymore. So maybe that's also one of the reasons why this book was, was later in, in 1802. It was not so much distributed in the Ukraine. So we understand why Rav Nachman asked the Maskilim in Uman, who they traveled all the time to Berlin, to Germany, and and they were close to the to the czar, to the king, and they, they were rich. They had medals, uh, so so it's very uh, it's very um, and they were great scholars too. So uh, and 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 so it's very understandable why Rav Nachman asked them to 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 uh, arrange for him the Yen Lebanon. And it seemed that even the Maskilim maybe didn't have at the time the Yen Lebanon because if if they did. Why do they wait eight years? Should they give to Rav Nachman right away the Yen Lebanon, and that's it? Why do they wait seven, eight years until until the the straight, the, the fire and bracelet? So it seems that the, even this Maskilim didn't have the book Yen Lebanon, but later they arranged it because Rav Nachman said, and then they, they, they brought it to Rav Nachman when Rav Nachman came to Uman. So, What was the story? I told you there was a big fight in 1782. What was the story then? In 1782, the name of Naftali Herz Weisel was very highly um, Regarded. Uh, accepted uh, in, in, the, in the rabbinic world. So much so that he was, Naftali Herz Weisel, even, even as a muscle in Berlin, as a modern Jew, with uh, with a wig, he wears a wig like you can see in the picture. Even though Weisel was considered the mashpia of the time, the religious influencer, influencer the religious apologist, and the 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 the, mechanic, the pedagogue, the religious pedagogue of the time, and everybody who wants to teach his children. Yiddishkeit, Torah, Emuna. They told him, the rabbis said, use Weisel's books. So much he was, but what happened in 1782, that the, the Kaiser, the Kaiser Joseph II from Austria, Austro-Hungary, Austro uh, this was in, uh, actually in, in, in 1781. In October 1781, he published a um, uh, pamphlet, or he made new rules. And part of the new rules was about the Jewish people. What, and to give them some liberations, some, some things that they were discriminated, he, lo he, he, he loses them. He, uh, he made them more loose. And one of the things is, until 1782, Jews were forbidden to go to school, to go to universities, to colleges. And, and um, 1782, the, the Kaiser, Yodot the II, said, the Jewish people should build their own schools with the, uh, uh, with the help of the government. 
and and they should have regular schools like everybody has. The children should learn all the all the stuff, not just Gemara and Chumash. So Naftali had Vaisu, when he saw this, he became very excited. And he published a pamphlet. A pamphlet, and in this pamphlet, he 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 tried to convince the Jews and the rabbis that this is not a bad thing from the case between the Kaiser. It's not a gazera. It's not an evil thing that you have to get rid of. But it's actually good for the Jews. And we shall all embrace it. We shall build our own schools, our own Jewish schools, modern schools, and so on and so on. But he was maybe not so smart. Naftali had Bible, after all, they say he was a Tommy. He was, in a way, he was very, in his, very much in his world, and he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't very smart all the time. For example, in that pamphlet, he wrote a few radical pieces. So radical that it, especially, Considered, considered, uh, considered at the time, 1782. Even today, such radical pieces that, that uh, even today in the, in the modern Jewish world, it will maybe be considered radical. Imagine in 1782. And because of these radical pieces, instead of winning the conviction to convince the rabbis, he basically angered the rabbis really so much that the Shabbat Haggadol speeches that every rabbi gives in the Shabbat before Pesach was dedicated against the evil vice in 1782. From great rabbis including the rabbi Kesteland of Prague that you have in the picture. Now, the same rabbis that 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 years before, they highly recommended Bible and they said everybody should teach his children his books and he is so great. The same, some of the same rabbis like Ezekiel Landau came out with the worst speeches against Bible. What was so radical about, what, what was these radical pieces that Bible wrote in 1782 in, this, in his pamphlet? For example, he said like this, said, we, people think we have only one Torah, but it's not true. We have two Torahs. One is Torah Sashem, the Torah of God. The other one is Torah Tadam, the Torah of you. And what is the Torah, what is the Torah of human? Everything that you don't have in the Torah. Manners, etiquette, languages, all the worldly knowledge, mathematics, and so on and so on. This is all the Torah of human that everyone has, not only the Jews. The Jews are privileged more than the Goyim that they have also the Torah of God. And the Goyim has only the Torah of human. But we Jews have both of us, and we have to consider both of us. Then he goes even further. If he would wrote only this, I'm not sure how many rabbis would come up against him. But it goes much further than it goes much further than it goes much more far than this. He said like this. He said, the Torah of human comes before the Torah of God. Before you teach the children the Torah of God, you have to teach them the Torah of human. And only after they know the Torah of human then you can understand and do the Torah of God. Then, even with this, I also don't know how, what big a ban it, was, it, it, it would be from the rabbis, but he, he does, he goes even further. And he says like this. He says, there is, there is a, 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 a saying from the Chazal, from the sages, the rabbis, the Talmud, the Midrash, that says, it's a famous saying, 
תלמיד חכם שאין בו דעת, נבלה טובה הנה. What's the meaning? How many people know Hebrew here? So, it means, it means, a Talmud Chacham, a, a Torah scholar, that doesn't have da'at. What is da'at? Knowledge. A Talmud Chacham that doesn't have da'at, uh, da that doesn't have knowledge, is worse than a Nevela. A dead animal is better than him. This Talmud Chacham is less than a dead animal. This is a saying from the rabbis in the Midrash. But, Weisel came and he used this saying of the Chazal. He used it for his purposes in that pamphlet. And he says like this A Talmud Chacham, a Torah scholar, that has only the Torah of God, but doesn't have the Torah of human. The Velak of Ahimen, a dead animal is better than him. He's less than a dead animal. How come, asks Weisel, What's the, what's, the, what's the logic of it? He says the logic goes like this. A dead animal in a vela is kosher or not? No. It's not, it's not kosher. But for the goyim, the Torah says, you can give it to the goyim, right? You can sell it to goyim. So, so, the, so, so he says like this. A Talmud a, a, a person that has the Torah of human and doesn't have the Torah of God, is he good or not? So he said, for the Jewish rabbis, he's not good. But for the other people of the world, for the other nations, he's good. Right? The person that has the Torah, Torah of human. But the person that has only the Torah of God and doesn't have the Torah of human, he is not good for nobody. Not for the goyim and not for the Jews. Because he can't do anything in the world. He's not good for he's good for nothing. So that's why he is less than a dead animal, because a dead animal, at least it's good for the goyim. But <laughs> but this Torah scholar is not for, not for the Jews and not for the goyim. The big animal. This is what he wrote in that text. You can imagine how that the rabbis took it so personal because in other words, he says that the rabbis of the period in 1782, in a time when Jews were forbidden to go to school, and most rabbis didn't have much of worldly knowledge. Some rabbis did, more or less, but most rabbis didn't. And he says, and, and he says that all these rabbis are good for nothing and less than a dead animal. <laughs> and he based it on the Chazal. That's even worse than ever. He based his, 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 his thoughts on the on the sages, as if as if the Talmud said it. So you can imagine what happened, 1783. But strange enough, strange enough. When it passed, passed, what happened after that? The rabbis came out against against Weisel. Weisel took it personal. Because in the end, <laughs> Weisel considered himself a part of the rabbinic establishment. Although he wasn't a rabbi himself, but he was a great Torah scholar. He wrote many books in Torah. And all his books is about Torah and Yiddishkeit and Amunah. And he was also great in rabbinics, in halakha, in Talmud. He wrote a book on Leviticus that the greatest rabbis of the generations, the greatest go on in. Like, you, you will go on a yeshiva and you will ask, who is the greatest guy on the greatest Torah genius? They will tell you names like Rabbi Kiva Eker, the Vilna Goen, Gaon of Vilna. Ramot Chabanet, they will say your names like this, that, like this. All these rabbis that I mentioned and many others love. They were crazy for Weisel's book on Leviticus. They loved it. They, they, were, they were, in Yiddish they say, lacking the fingers. They lick their fingers with this book. So, 
So he was considered, he considered himself a part of the rabbinic establishment after all, even though he's a Muslim. So he took it personal, the, 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 the fight of Rav Zgedi. So what, the, what he did, yeah? Um, I was arguing, I mean, it's so well researched and you're presenting a very complex problem. Yeah. Do you have the dates when Weissel put in the growth book of Leviticus, everyone sure. trace it, and sure. the I and the... Uh, sure, the, the book of Leviticus was published in 1783. And when was One it? year after the struggle. One year after that. That's the point I'm, I'm asking. Yeah. Um, since the, the profane, whatever you want to call it, book uh, that, that was uh, after, 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 after. was before the book of Leviticus. Yeah. I don't understand the embracing of his concept of Leviticus, and that's what I'm asking. No, I'm telling you later. In later years, yeah. in later years, oh. in the 200 years after my Ah, or, okay. The 150 years after my view, right. the greatest rabbis of the generation loved his his all his books because the pamphlet was uh, was um, uh, correctly destroyed. So that that makes sense. No, 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 no. It's not true. No, no, it's not true. It's not a manuscript. The pamphlet was printed and reprinted right. a few times. All the rabbis knew about this pamphlet, and that's so strange. How much Weisel was uh, rehabilitated and uh, how would you say uh, reinstated? Vindic vindicated? Yeah, vindicated. <laughs> his reputation. It's his his reputation. reputation was vindicated through the years. How did it happen? Because Weisel, in he wrote he wrote an answer to the rabbis, and he told them, "I don't know what you want from me. I didn't meant it like you understood. I meant it much more. I I, I didn't meant it like that." I, I meant to say that the uh, Torah scholar that talks that his uh, manners, he is less than that animal. But, but uh, I didn't talk about someone that doesn't have all the knowledge. So, and, and, and so on, he goes further, further, he wrote the whole pamphlet to, to convince himself. And then he, he, he teases the rabbis, and he said again, and he, he provokes them again, and he tells them, why did you all come so fast, you made the judgment so fast, you didn't ask me before what I meant and so on. And then he says, this is what I cried in my first pamphlet. Etiquette, etiquette, where is your etiquette? So he provoked the rabbis a second time. So, so, so the rabbis that came out against him wasn't much convinced by his second pamphlet. But other rabbis had planned to go against him that for preparing themselves, many rabbis in Germany, they they, they accepted the second time. Then what happened? He 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 sent his his uh, the whole battle, the whole two pamphlets, he sent it to Italy. In Italy, the Jewish community in Italy and the Jewish rabbis were much more modern and relative to the Polish rabbis. Okay. So the rabbis in Italy wrote psachim, uh, wrote uh, responses, letters, and to to defend Bible. And it was it was this was published in uh, in in in, in 1784. And then Bible wrote a fourth pamphlet that he he he, quoted, he, he took one of the big big Shabbat Hagadol speeches against him. He quoted he. Published it from manuscript with his answers, with his comments. Okay, so this was a big, big, big pamphlet that he wrote in 1785. Then in 1786, he published his famous book Sefer Amidot. That this is that this is a book that no rabbi would be embarrassed with a book like that. This is a, a, a book that can that can be written by the greatest rabbi. A book about him, about the Yiddishkeit, about the Muna, and, and, and so on and so on. And then he wrote, later he wrote an epos on, on Moses. He took, he, he wrote a poetry, poetry on the stories of, of the Exodus and the giving of the Torah. 
and this was the first, for the first time in, 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 in for the first time in history, that you had a big, a, a, a big epos on Moses, a, a poetry on the whole, on the whole uh, Exodus, and this was a very, very, very great thing considered at the time, and this made him very popular by the by the masculine and by the Jewish world by, in general. Even many rabbis are, are ha, have much praise about his his poetry. Should I? Can we make a connection at this point, or is that? I can make. I can make. So the same the same thing. The point is, Weisel and Mendelssohn were, were uh, rehabilitated, and this and this went on for about eighty years, until until eighteen sixty two. It started a new a new wave of negativity against. Who? Not Weisel, a little bit Weisel, but mainly Mendelssohn. So what happened in 1782, Weisel was the devil, and Mendelssohn was also wrong because he is a colleague and a, and a mentor of the devil. But what happened in, since 1862, it switched around. Weisel was still considered kosher until recently, but Mendelssohn became, became, became the scapegoat. And, and this is going on until today. But today, it happened since 2002. 2002, uh, many rabbis in Israel today came out, not against Mendelssohn, but against Weizen. So it still, it still switched around a little bit. And what happened, there is a group went to these rabbis that published a ban against Weizel's books in Israel today. They went to these rabbis and they showed them all the, all the, all the evidence and all the sources. And they showed them that they were, they were fooled around, that they, were, they, they, wasn't, they, they, they didn't, they, they wasn't told the truth by the person who took the signatures from them. And many rabbis in Israel came out with signatures and letters that they they, they retreat and buy with a tzaddik. But, 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 this is, this is still a secret. These letters of the rabbis wasn't published yet. It will be soon. I'm waiting. So, huh? <laughs> I'm waiting. So, what happened, Weisel was indicated in, in, after in the 1790s, plus Mendelssohn. Now, in 70, one of the, who was, when you go to a yeshiva, and you, any yeshiva, and you ask them, who was the rabbi that banned, banned that banned Mendelssohn? You know what they will tell you? The rabbi of Prague, Ezekiel Lando, the author of Noda Bihuda, who you have in the, who you have in the picture. So, there is here a manuscript written. There's here, you all have, you all have a copy yeah. of a manuscript written in, in 1810. Written in 1810, 30 years after the, the, the ban. Written by the son of the Rabbi of Prague. And he writes in his father's name, in the name of the Rabbi of Prague, highly, highly praise on Moses Mendelssohn and his German translation of the Bible. Now, this manuscript was censored. Why? This manuscript, who, who received this manuscript? Who had it? It's owned by a Hasidic rabbi today. He gave a copy of the manuscript, 32 pages, to the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. But this piece, this piece, the praise on Mendelssohn, that that took took about took uh, it, it took um, about two pages of the manuscript. He covered it, as you can see in the picture. He covered it, and nobody has 
has uh, access to it. But there is a group, the same group that I told you, how, how, in, in, whatever, it's a long story, but they managed to receive a copy of the original, and they plan to publish this hidden manuscript. So, so, so this is very interesting how the whole censorship goes. There is a book of Professor Mark Sapiro about Haredi censorship, what's going on today. Uh, maybe he talks also a little bit, I didn't read his book, so I don't know, but, but it's very possible that he talks also about the issues with Mendelssohn and Baizu. But even Professor Mark Sapiro, he doesn't have the hidden manuscript. And, and um, we have it, I'm a part of the team. So, and we're gonna publish it. So, could, could you at least share with us what the hidden manuscript says? The hidden manuscript basically says that when the German translation of Men Moses Mendelssohn were published, there were some rabbis that were against it and wanted to put his book, wanted to, to make a ban on his book. But they wanted to have the support of the rabbi of Prague, Ezekiel Landau. So they sent letters to Ezekiel Landau with, with, with harsh negativity and complaints against the, 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 the German translation of Moses Mendelssohn. And they asked him to support them to make a ban on the book. And he refused. He not just he refused, but he told to his son, I, there is, oh, he refused, and he answered them a letter, stop doing this st crazy stuff, stop, stop being obsessed about this, it's, I don't see anything wrong about this book, and that's why the ban, in fact, never came out. The ban against Mendelssohn in the, in the in German translation of the Bible, in fact, it never, it, 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 it stayed a, 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 a thought, it, it never came to pass. And then he says other things that his father told him about uh, how his father talked to him, was very respectful. He had, he, his father, Rav he had some, he had some uh, comments, he had some arguments against uh, what Mendelssohn wrote in his book, but, 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 but not personal, to attack him, but talking highly about himself, but uh, a, a rabbinic Torah mistake that he, some Torah mistake that he, that he made in his, in, his, in his book, you know? So, uh, and then the son of, the, the son goes further to write that many people are like to, to, to look for, to look for um, negativity, to look, to, to seek for, for damages in books, to seek for uh, problems in books, and to and to 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 um, to to, to, to uh, came out negative about authors, and 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 here he said, but the, the, the real the real the true the true matter is no, every person can make a mistake, but it doesn't affect the greatness of the person, and it doesn't affect the greatness of the. Huh? 